1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 1. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. But is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 17. Father, thank you for this, your word. And we want to encounter you today. Lord, we do not want to check the box to mail it in and to drift over a number of things that have nothing to do with you. Because, Lord, th that will not happen when we stand in your presence immediately. Lord, we're so prone to wander. We're so prone to question. Uh, even as Helen prayed um, this morning in our prayer meeting, we're so, pr we're so fickle. We don't understand something you're doing. We don't like something you're doing. And we just, we doubt you, Lord. And we all do it. We want to we rest in you, though, this morning. We want to hear from you, Lord. We want you. We just want more of you. Um, so would you, would you move in our hearts, whether someone's heart is hopeful or discouraged, um, hot for you right now or cold for you, Lord? Whether somebody is here because they were excited to meet with you or whether they're here out of obligation, Lord, none of that handcuffs the Holy Spirit. So would you move in our hearts this morning, Lord? Would you move in our hearts? Um, we want to be able to say, as jacked up as the church at Corinth was, they were able to say, surely God was in our midst. So God, would you continue to manifest your presence? Just be with us. We know you're everywhere, but be with us to bless, to convict where we need to be convicted, Lord, to encourage where we need to be encouraged, and ultimately to be changed more in the image of Christ. And if anyone here can say the right things in their head about Christ, but has never truly trusted him in their heart, 
would today be the day in which they, the chains fall off and they rise and they follow you. Alive in Christ, our living head. And we pray this in his name. Amen. All right, you may grab a seat. Good to see you this morning. Good to see you on this beautiful September morning. Well, it has been some 287 days since we were last in our series in 1 Corinthians. And believe it or not, I did some checking on that. There was another 189-day gap in our series in 1 Corinthians because of COVID and adjustments and different series and a whole bunch of stuff like that. Today we're coming back, and we're actually going to finish this series in 1 Corinthians, accepting a quick uh, Christmas break for a Christmas series. And we're going to do so, however, with a little bit of a twist. And I realize I am trying to thread a needle on this. If we were to pick up where we left off, we would be, anybody know what chapter? It's been so long, you probably don't. It's okay. Yeah, that, thank you, Brian. That's exactly right. We'd be in 1 Corinthians 11. However... We have new people here, new faces here, and I thought, this is just going to be really odd to jump right in uh, when it's been a long time and people won't get the the entire picture, the entire flow. On the other hand, I did not want to subject and afflict those of you who were here during the series with every sermon repeated. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to reboot 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 10 in about 11 or 12 sermons, so roughly a sermon, a chapter. Then we'll go to our Christmas series, and then when we get into the new year, we'll slow down to our previous cadence and get into 1 Corinthians 11. So that's kind of the plan, uh, what we're going to do. Now, one of the reasons we, as our typical fair, preach through books of the Bible at Restored Church is because um, it gives us a Clint Eastwood kind of approach. That's uh, an expression I've used for about a decade. If you know any of his movies, you know one of his movies is The Good, Bad, and Ugly, right? And there's all of the above in Scripture. And if you're just topically preaching, you're probably not going to get the stuff that's outside the category of what we would call good. So when you preach through books of the Bible, it, it forces you to address the good, the bad, and the ugly. That makes sense? Now, have you ever noticed that when we look back on things, we, take, we tend to, most of us, not everybody, but most of us, we tend to look back on things and make them better than they really were. We tend to romanticize the past. And people do that with the early church. Oh, the early church, if we could just be like the early church, they had perfect, uninterrupted, blissful fellowship. No one ever left. There was never any conflicts. Nobody ever died. Rich doctrine. There was no doctrinal disputes at all. Everybody got along with everybody perfectly. There was no no need for church discipline. There was no intramural fighting. There was no cold shoulder. Everybody triple tithed. There was 110% workout for work projects and all the rest. That was the early church. Sometimes people say, I wish we were like the early church. The good news is we are like the early church. The bad news is that's not good news. Now, of course, there was a lot of good stuff at the church at Corinth, but a quick survey of the problems that afflicted this church will dispel the notion quite rapidly that everything was hunky-dory. What you had at this early church was divisiveness, Factionalizing behind rival leaders, infighting, intellectual arrogance, pride, superiority, homosexuality, incest. One guy was sleeping with his dad's wife. Celibacy in marriage that was called spiritual. Sexual activity outside of marriage. Immorality in the kind of sleeping with prostitutes. There was divorce. There was failure to practice church discipline because of their pride in their tolerance. There was idolatry. There was materialism. There was drunkenness, and they had game on that. They even knew how to get drunk at the Lord's table. How many times do you have to get in line for that to happen? There was a lack of sensitivity in gray areas. 
There was chaos in their worship gatherings. There was abuse of spiritual gifts, people acting as if their gifts were jewelry to show off rather than tools to serve others with. There was abuse and confusion over gender roles. That'll be 1 Corinthians 11. There was reluctant giving. There was bad teaching about the resurrection and on. So yeah, there was just an issue or two at the church of Corinth. Any one of which individually would not be healthy for a church. But can you imagine if you had all those problems at a church? That would be one toxic stew, and that's exactly what it was. And the reason is, and here's the big idea of the sermon series, is they had forgotten the gospel. Now, to be clear, not forgetting in a head kind of way, they hadn't forgotten it that way. I'm sure if you had asked one of them, hey, what's the gospel? They could have, you know, walked you through the facts of the gospel. But I think they had forgotten the gospel in a heart kind of way. It was no longer the engine driving their life. And because they had forgotten the gospel in a heart kind of way, they succumbed to something that I succumbed to and you succumbed to and we all succumb to at times in different ways, and that is compartmentalized Christianity. You know, you have this compartment and you have the gospel right, and you, and you, and you can be actually be very eloquent about your theology and accurate and all that, but there's other compartments in your life that have not yet been invaded and shaped and changed by the gospel. You have compartments in your life without the gospel, and then you got your gospel. We all, we all, we all can do that in different ways, right? And I think if you look at the context, just to revisit the context of the church at Corinth, they lived in a space that was very tough to walk with Christ, which I think made it all the easier to forget the gospel and to embrace compartmentalized Christianity. For example, Corinth was a really depraved place. There were um, pagan worship shrines everywhere. And in fact, idol worship was just part of their everyday fabric of society woven into every aspect of societal life. Idol worship was part of governmental affairs. Idol worship was part of being part of a trade guild civic festivals, social clubs, and on and on and on and on. I'll give you one example. Towering above the city of Corinth was the ancient temple of Aphrodite, about 800 feet in the air. Every night, 1,000 cult prostitutes, male and females, would descend down into the city to ply their wares, and the average citizen uh, took advantage of their services. It was actually just as normal as, say, Streaming Netflix. It was part and parcel of everyday life for people. Extremely depraved place. What's more is Corinth was no, so known for drunkenness that across the Roman Empire, if there was a play and they wanted you to know that the actor was from Corinth in that particular play, they would have at least one scene when that actor would come out or actress would come out super drunk and they'd say, oh, that's a Corinthian. And if a woman was a promiscuous woman, she was known as a Corinthian. Think about that. I mean, the Roman Empire wasn't exactly Puritanville, right? And yet even among the Roman Empire, it had such a reputation about being promiscuous and loose and drunk that if you, if you were in any of those sins in a strong way, they gave you the slur of being a Corinthian. This is a depraved place, a very decadent place. They would have these massive spa complexes in which all, all kinds of things would happen there. They were absolutely infest, um, I would say obsessed and infatuated with entertainment. They were just all about entertainment. And one of the ways they did it back then is they would have these traveling speech givers who would come into town to various venues, ask what they wanted to hear a speech about the next day, they would pay them a handsome sum of money. They would come back the next day. They would be almost naked, all greased up. That was part of the attraction. And then they would wax eloquent about whatever the assigned topic was. What mattered, it didn't matter whether that topic was true. It just mattered whether they could speak well. Infatuated with entertainment. 
They, was the sec- they hosted the second largest athletic games be- behind, I think, the Olympian Games. They're called the Isthmian Games. And they had the precursor to the UFC. That was before they fought to decision. They fought to the death. They, had, they were massively known for gladiator fights in their arena right there. And then it was just a driven city, not just decadent, not just depraved. It was driven. It was a city all hopped up on success and achievement and climbing the social ladder. You step on anybody's back at anybody's cost to get what you want. One commentator put it this way. He said, to use terms from American culture, schmoozing, massaging egos, scratching each other's backs, and dragging rivals' names all through the mud describe what was required to attain success in the ancient city of Corinth. Now, I would just say, I would just make an art to us. I would say because of, because of our depraved context, because of our decadent context, because of our driven context, I think it also, likewise for us, makes it all the easier to compartmentalize our Christianity, right? And to forget the gospel in a heart kind of way. And that's why this book and getting back to it is so good because it, what it does is this. It, it, it forces us to put the gospel on the front burner again. It forces us to look at all of life through the gospel, even those unsurrendered, unsubmitted, hidden compartments. Here's a quick test for you. Just to see if, how you're doing with this compartmentalized Christianity thing. I want you to think right now of some struggle that you're having. Maybe it's um, a conflict with somebody. Uh, Maybe it's a self-esteem issue. Just whatever the thing is that has come to mind, are you applying the gospel to it? Or is even that question a bit like a foreign language? Well, what do you mean applying the gospel? The gospel gets me to heaven, but up to that, I'm just on my own. No, like the gospel is a banquet for us. So how do you respond to that question? We're going to see in this book how the gospel addresses absolutely everything and everything in life. It's to be the lens through which we look at everything in our life. And so what we're going to do this morning is kind of just get back into the book with this big idea, get back to the gospel. We're going to look at verses 1 through 17, which was a few sermons before, and we're going to have three basic movements This is what Paul does, and we can't obviously go through every verse, verse by verse at this pace, but we're going to get the big idea. We're going to see Paul, first of all, starts with the good, then he goes to the bad, and then he gets back to the gospel. So in verses 1 through 9, Paul starts with the good. You might say he starts with commendation. Verse 2, as I just read, he calls them saints. He says, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Now, you got to admit, when you think of these Corinthians, you don't think of saints, right? He's not obviously calling them saints because they're the holiest bunch around. So why is he calling them saints? Because he's choosing to see their position before their practice. A good place to start with somebody who confesses Christ, right? Now, it's not that he doesn't address sin. He clearly does. It's not that he thinks that all of them are Christians. He doesn't. But it's just a manner, it's just a way of showing that when he ministered to people, he chose to start and see their confession in Christ first and then work off of that. And that's what we do. That's what we should do with people, right? Hey, you confess to follow Christ. We encourage people with that. And then what's the outflow of that? Moving on, verses 4 and 5, and again, I'm just summarizing. He moves on to actually thank God for these ones. Remember that list of things they were doing? Nonetheless, Paul thanks God for them. And what's even crazier is he thanks God for the very thing that they're abusing. The fact that God gave them grace. You have to admit, if, if we see somebody abusing grace... We don't want them to do this with us, but we'll get right to the law, right? Forget this grace thing. You're abusing it. Get the law. Paul doesn't do that. Paul thanks God for them, and it says 
he thanks God because of the grace that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge. He moves beyond that. He not only sees their position first, he not only thanks God for them and thanks God for the grace that he's given them, he actually, he, he, he recognizes God's work in them. See that word testimony? Verse, what is it, verse 6? <laughs> I thank God going down even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among, among you. He, he literally says, I've seen God's hand in your life. You have a testimony. Moving beyond that, he not only recognizes that, he recognizes that they're gifted so that you're not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he reminds them of God's faithfulness. Again, what would we do? Easily do. We remind them of God's coming judgment, man. You keep on that path, right? And he does some of that to be sure. But he starts off by reminding them of God's faithfulness. You see that? It's beautiful. It's so encouraging. He says, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I want to ask the question to close out point number one. What in the world is Paul doing? What do you think? You think maybe he's being sarcastic? You know, he could be sarcastic at times. He used some sanctified sarcasm. Was he doing that? Is he just using good psychology, good leadership? You know, you commend before you correct, which is a good thing to do. And while there might be some of that in there, I think the ultimate reason he's doing that is simply because he really loves them. He really loves the church at Corinth. And somebody, in a bit of a humorous fashion, outlined the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, this way. Point one, 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 8, I really love you. Point two, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 9, all the way to chapter 15, but you are an absolute mess. Point three, chapter 16, but I still really love you. I don't think Paul ever got over the grace that was given him. He says in 1 Timothy 1.16, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And you can't love people that way unless you really know how undeservedly and deeply you are loved by God yourself. People can't extend that love vertically or showing they're not, or horizontally are showing they're not experiencing in that moment that love vertically. May God give us that kind of love for each other, right? That starts with position before practice, that gives thanks to God for each other and the grace that God has given us, that recognizes God's work, that recognizes God's gifting and reminds people of their faithfulness. That's what love does, and that's what Paul did. But love also does this. It's not in spite of Paul's love, but because of Paul's love for them, he also now, second of all, addresses their stuff, right? And that's because Paul loves them so much, his identity is not all tied up in what they think of him. Think about that. If you want to be Mr. or Mrs. Likeable, then you will not love people, you're really loving yourself. It's called the fear of man, we all succumb to that, right? Right? But Paul, second of all, now, because he really loves them, goes to the bad. Now, remember that list of sins, the things, the issues that was afflicting that church? There are some pretty bad ones. What would you say were some of the really bad ones? Just, just call them out as you remember them. What were some of the bad ones? Church mice. What's that? Ah, you jumped the gun on me. We might, we, we do this red light district respectable sin thing, don't we? We probably say, oh, the really bad one, that's the sexual immorality, that's the incest, that's the homosexuality, or at least we would say the bad teaching about the resurrection. Are any of those things good? No. But he starts off with the most devastating sin to the health of the church. He starts off with the most destructive sin to the church, that is divisiveness 
Thank you for jumping the gun on me, Brian. Infighting, factionalism, that really is the most destructive to the church. And this is another brushstroke warning inspired by the Holy Spirit to say, this is no small thing when it happens. But even here, I want you to see, Paul starts positive. He says, I appeal to you, brothers. I mean, this is heart language right here, you know? You sit down with somebody, man, I'm just appealing to you. You're speaking to them from your heart to their heart. This is heart language. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, he's being positive, that you all agree, that there be no divisions among you, it's the word tearing. When there's division, there's tearing in the body. And he goes on to say, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. To be united was a word that you see in secular use of that time to mend nets or to mend fractured bones. He's calling them to turn from divisiveness and to re-embrace unity. Verses 11 and 12, he dials in on the issue. He says, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you. There it is. Infighting, factionalizing, quarreling among you, my brothers. And he amplifies in verse 12 when he says, what I mean is this. That one of you, say, each one of you says, I follow Paul. Now, Commentators have called those people um, the loyalist. Paul, after all, wasn't he the founding pastor? And, and people who on Team Paul probably said, we love Paul. He cares more about substance than style like these young upstarts, you know. He's just a solid Bible teacher. And we've drifted from the founding pastor's vision and the vision of the church originally. We drifted from that original vision. We need to get back to what Paul taught. Team Paul. Let's get back to the original vision. Give us the same, the good old days and the good old ways. That's kind of the, the mentality they say of Team Paul. And then you had those who said, I follow Apollos. Some have called them the stylist. Remember in Acts chapter 18, I think it is, where uh, Apollos is, is, is commended as an extremely gifted public speaker. He's a, he's a grand orator. He has a silver tongue. Great speaker. People love to hear him speak. And then when Priscilla and Aquila get with him and they help him connect the dots with the gospel more, he just ups his craft. He becomes a better preacher. This is the kind of guy whose Twitter feed was full of likes. His conference schedule was packed with speaking arrangements. People said, we, he's witty, he's funny, he's creative. The people love him. He's so relevant. He's so fresh. He connects, you know, the gospel to everyday life. We're, we're team Apollos. And then you had team Cephas. I follow Cephas, which is Peter. Those are called the traditionalists. There was probably some Jewish believers who said, no, Peter's our guy. Because when the gospel started going to the nations, they forgot that we were the apple of God's eye, the Jewish people, and he brought the gospel to us. He was the missionary to the Jews, Peter was. And they probably said, listen, Paul's, you know, he's legit, he's a real apostle, but our guy, he was one of the original 12 apostles. In fact, the church was built on his confession that Jesus is the Christ. So what was happening, we can only surmise on these things, but you had this factionalizing going on, right? And what is clear is they had their preferences among their leaders. Now, is it bad to have preferences among leaders? Yes or no? Just be honest. Is it bad? No. It's just a chemistry thing, right? You click with more, more than others. You can't help that. But we have to watch out that your preferences or favor for one does not manifest itself in becoming a prejudice or disfavor for another. You gotta watch out for that. In other words, you gotta watch out for the fact that you click especially good with one, or two perhaps, or three or whatever the case may be, 
keep you from clicking up, different spelling of the word, with others who click like you with that person. When we get that mentality of, I like him, he's my guy, he cares more about this, he cares more about that, he's on my team, I'm on his team, what we're doing is instead of realizing that just like in, in the body at large, we have different body parts, right, for the good of the body, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, we'll see that. Also among leaders, there's variance by divine design. According to gifting and calling and equipping and training and experience and personality and background, upbringing and all the rest. And they're all by divine design for the good of the body. And what they were doing is they were simply reflecting the culture around them that loved to lift up leaders and form a tribe around that leader. They were the precursors to celebrity culture, and celebrity Christianity is a terrible thing. Now, you might say, well, I'm so glad that at least there was Team Jesus. Because that last group said, I follow Christ. They're the ones that had it right, right? Uh, wrong. They may have been the worst set at all. Whereas on the one side, the Team Paul the team Apollos, the team Cephas, they were sinfully exalting human leadership. It's likely that team Jesus people sinfully rejected human leadership. That can be very, very uh, injurious to the health of a church. And they did so under the guise of false spirituality. We don't need, uh, you know, an accountability with a human leader because we go right to Jesus. And that's what the gospel is. It takes us right to Jesus, right? Forgetting that Jesus gave leaders Ephesians 4 as gifts to the church. Forgetting Hebrews 13, 17, that leaders are to be submitted to and obeyed. And it may be that these were people who did not want to submit. They, 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 they rejected the idea of accountability, of commitment, you know, maybe to a particular church. Well, I'm... I, I'm Hey, also, I'm part of the church at Colossae, too. Not just the church at Corinth, and I'm part of the universal church, and I'm the church at Thessalonica, so I don't, why would I need to submit to any local church? We're all the body of Christ. You know that kind of thing? And that's a spirit of prideful unsubmission. And it also may be that Team Jesus people had legitimate spiritual gifts and experiences that others did not have in the body of Christ, but were not mature enough um, to hold those gifts in a way that was uplifting, which is super, I mean, they, they would have fancied themselves, we're part of the deeper life club. We've had this experience and other people haven't, which is extremely ironic because true spirituality is marked not by the sharing of the gifts of the Spirit, but by bearing the fruits of the Spirit. Now, stepping back, he is dialing in on what issue at that church in chapter 1. Division. And whatever the cause of division, whether it's factualizing behind leaders, it doesn't seem the leaders were trying to, to pull that off. It seems in this case that the church at large was. Um, or whether it's because of different views on various issues around. Any kind of factionalizing um, is a very dangerous thing because it fractures the church. But the way it works, it's very insidious. It's not like right in your face, Right? And often it's like if your windshield's fractured, you get a little pebble, boom, and you get that little divot, and you think, I ain't going to happen to it, right? I don't need to call the guy and fill in acrylic and all that. But what happens? Heat and cold, heat and cold shrinks and expands it, and pretty soon you have a spider web of crack across your windshield, and the windshield is toast. That, my friends, is what <laughs> Paul is calling out because he knows it can do that. So he starts with the good. He goes to the bad, and finally, he gets back to the gospel. Now, this is going to be really obvious next week, but we're going to end with verses 13 through 17. What he's going to do is he's going to highlight the problem of factionalizing by asking three piercing, targeted questions designed to expose the fact that they had forgotten the gospel in a heart kind of way. Question one is what? Is Christ divided? 
just as the church right now is in Christ in heaven, Christ right now is in the church on earth. So when we, uh, when we factionalize, when there is the quarreling, the infighting, the divisiveness, it is like taking a machete against Christ himself because he is the one who fills the body all in all, right? And we know this from Acts when, when Paul was persecuting the church and he's, he's, you know, he's picking on Christians and, and Jesus says, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Like, what do you mean? I didn't see you. Yes, when you persecute one of my people, you're persecuting me. If that's true outside the church, that's also true inside the church. He's not real good on that. You basically, when we do this, we are denying the fruit of the gospel, which is the creation of the body of Christ that he indwells. And we're kind of saying, I don't need every body part, and I don't need every leader. The second question is this. It gets more to the point. He says, was Paul crucified for you? Now, what's he getting at there? I think he's saying, y'all are acting like I'm the one that gets you right with God. Y'all acting like the one that, I'm the one that laid down an atoning sacrifice, that, I, that I'm the Savior. Don't look at me and follow me in that kind of way or any other guys. Christ is Savior. Paul wasn't crucified for you. Christ was crucified for you. He's getting to the gospel. And then he asked this question, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now, what is that about? Well, he, he's basically... Well, what, at, at baptism, you can think of baptism this way. I think, I think this is fair to say. At baptism, it's a commissioning of sorts, right? Like, you, you're not saved through your baptism. You're saved previous to your baptism. And then you say, you know, I, don't, I want people to publicly know that I'm a Christ follower. So I'm going to submit to the waters of bathroom, uh, bathroom, <laughs> baptism. Uh, wow. <laughs> Glad that's not being live streamed. So more people would be laughing right now. Six other people. Um, so, uh, let me get back on. So, a baptism is your public commissioning, right? You go down, not in the waters of the bathroom, but of the baptismal, you say, I died with Christ and I've been raised again, right? And you come up out of that water and the idea is, I'm now going to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm vowing allegiance to him. So, Paul is saying, did you vow allegiance to me? I'm not your Lord, nor any of these other chumps. We're pointing you to the Lord, but Jesus is Lord. That's what's he, what he's getting at with that question. And then in verses 14 through 16, it's kind of humorous. Look at verse 14. He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. What's he, now, what's he getting at there? I thought baptism was important, didn't you? Baptism is important, but it's not part of the gospel. What he's saying is, I was not about gaining followers of me, baptizing people in my name, like you guys seem to think that I did. He said, I wasn't about that. And it's kind of funny. He says, that's why he says, I, I, don't, I don't think I really baptized too many people. Look at it again. I baptized, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. Like I was trying to get a following. And it's kind of funny because he had a, a scribe, Sosthenes, he's in verse 1 or 2. And he, you know, Paul would dictate to him and Sosthenes would write out the letter. And it's like probably at that point, Sosthenes said, wait a second, Paul, you also baptized the household of Stephanus. And he's like, okay, yeah, that's right, I did. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know if I baptized anybody else. Basically, what's going on there? This text supports, by the way, verses 14 through 16, what the rest of the New Testament teaches, that baptism, while important, is not part of the saving equation. The saving equation is Jesus, period, right? Because some people say, oh, you know, cults say you got, and that's what they are, cults. If, if anybody says you need to be baptized to be saved, that's cultic thinking. That's not biblical thinking. Because Paul, would, the last thing Paul would have boasted, I hardly baptized anybody. If baptism was necessary for salvation, right? Because verse 17 says he came to preach the gospel. He says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. He's putting them as two different things. Well, baptism is important, but it's a response to saving faith. 
not something that, that saves you. And, and I, I think that cannot be reiterated enough because people come from all kinds of faith backgrounds. What saves a person is not washing in a baptismal, let alone a bathroom, in water, but the washing of the blood of Jesus Christ by faith. And when Jesus Christ was up on that cross, shedding his blood as a ransom, atoning sacrifice for our sins, and that one guy on the cross, that thief said, Lord, remember me when you come into paradise. Jesus didn't say, mm, I sure wish I could do something about this, but you can't get baptized. You're up here on a cross just like I am. No, he says, today you will be with me in paradise. Now we end with verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize. Again, the idea is I wasn't about promoting myself, right? I wasn't about gaining a following. So stop doing that with me or anyone else. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, he says. And he goes on to say, with, not with words of eloquent, eloquent wisdom. Paul is not saying that he didn't use uh, passion, right? He's not saying that. Paul is not saying he did not use even the powers of persuasion. He, read the book of Romans. He quite obviously does. What Paul is saying is this. We're going to dive into this next week. That he refused to sugarcoat the gospel. He refused to use the tactics and maneuvering of manipulation. That he would rather make the gospel plain than palatable lest he, in his own words, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Now next week we're going to see how they were doing that, how they were tapping in to the culture's narrative of what they thought wisdom is and what they thought power is, and they were robbing the cross of its power. But we're going to end right here and just say this. Right now, Paul is sounding a five-alarm fire alarm because they are having a five alarm fire. This divisiveness, this little divot in the windshield, if it is unchecked, whoo, splinters in all kinds of direction. It's not gone unnoticed by me that several people have reached out to me and said, wow, that was crazy, that message you preached a couple of years ago, because I, I did it in much slower fashion. But that's what Paul talks about. Now listen, if a church is going to be healthy, it has to get back to the message that birthed it in the first place. If a Christian, if a Christian is going to get healthy, that Christian has to get back to the message that birthed her or him in the first place. What would you think if this church never preached the gospel, applied the gospel, talk about the gospel, or any church. What would you think about that church? Any, it's not a church, right? Social club. And it's crazy how we can be critical about a church on that, but we can be social clubs ourselves. How often do you apply the gospel in everyday life? How often do you figure out how does the gospel connect to this issue? And maybe this is something that was more, something you thought of more in the past. And maybe this is a call for the Lord to return you. Listen, my brother. Listen, my sister. I want you to get back to the gospel. I want you to get back to applying the gospel to everything in your life so that bit by bit, that gospel compartment begins to destroy for your ultimate joy the compartmentalization of those hidden spots in your Christian walk. That's the hope, right? That's what I want in my heart. I got some compartments. Do you have any compartments? Maybe we can talk about some of those compartments Wednesday night. I'm grateful for you and I love you. And I pray that as we reboot this series, God will do some rebooting.
in our souls. Father, thank you so much for this time this morning in your word. Um, thank you that now we can sing back to you if we're able to sing. Uh, we can at least reflect on what we've heard. Um, we can respond. We can respond in our hearts. We can respond in various ways. Um, so, Lord, I prayed uh, a while ago that this would, we would not mail it in and, and check the box and not drift. And I pray that over this final time of singing, Lord, that our attention would be on you because it's then that you speak to our hearts. When we, when we <laughs> power down and be still that know that you, and know that you're God. So, Lord, I, I pray that over us as we conclude this worship gathering this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.